everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Alice Morrison. I'm one of the co-directors of Friends of Family Farmers. And I'm going to kick us off by just giving some context for our organization and how we work with the partners you're going to hear from this evening. So I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> All right, so we are Friends of Family Farmers. And as you can see, our mission here um, encompasses both policies and programs and that wrap around service provision um, partnered with systems change is how we enact our view of the future and create economically viable community agricultural systems in Oregon. Um, the vision that we have for the future is, as Brittany said, a local diversified and interconnected agricultural future built by small and mid-sized farms where people, animals, communities, and ecosystems thrive and equitable, equitable policies improve lives and land for all Oregonians. We were founded in 2005 by a group of farmers and concerned rural residents who did not feel that they were represented by the current or the then current agricultural interests in Salem and, um, and in Washington, there was not a voice for farmers who didn't fit into conventional or commodity groups. And FOF was born out of the need for better representation for diversified and local market farms across the state. Uh, we wanted to make agricultural policy that worked for the reality of all farmers in Oregon and not just those who have the means to send a lobbyist to Salem. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so we have three buckets that our programming falls into. Uh, programs specifically for farmers, specifically for eaters and community members, and then advocacy, which brings those two worlds together. Our farmer programs are the Oregon Pasture Network, which is a community of practice, educational platform, and marketing channel for pasture-based animal agricultural producers. Uh, they are focused on climate resilient agricultural practices, responsible land stewardship, animal welfare, and bringing the highest quality um, animal agriculture products to their communities. Uh, if you are looking for some uh, local farmers to buy from, especially if you're looking for live animal shares like holes, halves, and quarter animals directly from the farm and you want to know where your meat is coming from, please head over to www.oregonpasturenetwork.org and check out our pastured producer guide. Our second perennial farmer program is Oregon FarmLink. This is the preeminent platform for connecting land seekers and land holders across Oregon to keep ag land in production and pass it on to the next generation of land stewards. This program also has expanded in the last few years to include a one-on-one -on -one technical assistance arm, our Navigate program, which helps uh, land seekers complete and produce a specialized one-on-one -on -one land plan, land access plan to take them from uh, their business plan and being ready to find the right piece of land to a land security solution. Um, head on over to Oregon, OregonFarmLink.org and um, in the About Us tab, check out the Navigate program. They are currently accepting applications for BIPOC land seekers across the state. This is one of the farms that we work with. This is an example of our pasture network programming. Um, this is a pasture walk. We offer a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities where farmers can grow and learn from each other. And then these are some of the cows from one of our OPN members. This is Nehalem River Ranch out on the coast. And then eater programs include things like informations. So this is a platform where we can bring farmers and eaters together to talk about the um, opportunities and barriers that are impacting the way that they get together and the way they can interact. And this um, is a great example because those conversations have progressed far enough that we've developed the policies you're gonna hear about tonight. And all of the ways that uh, we are trying to shift the paradigm to help uh, farmers and the eaters that, that love and depend on them um, thrive here in Oregon. 
Yes. <laughs> and this is what our informations looked like when we did them in person. We do hope to return to some in-person or at least hybrid programming this year. Uh, there's nothing like gathering in person and we're so appreciative that you're here tonight, but we hope to see you in many ways in the next, um, the coming years. And then that brings us to advocacy, the reason that we're here tonight. So this, these are some examples of policies that we work on that we're proud to claim as victories. And pretty much all of these we did in coalition. Um, we may have put a lot of work into activating our base around these, pro these problems and finding solutions for them, but there is no way to do, um, to do policy work as a grassroots organization on your own. It's incredibly difficult and it's so important to bring partners together to make sure all stakeholder groups are represented. Um, for example, the Farm Direct Law was, um, we were instrumental in passing that in, 20, in 2011, but that law also brought together the farmer's market community, um, the OSU extension community, ODA food safety folks, and farmers from across the state who were already interested in producing these kinds of products. Um, and that's like, value added products that you can bring uh, under the farm direct producer process exemption. Um, and then for example, uh, down there, our most recent victory is our participation in the farm worker overtime campaign. We were one of the biggest farm farmer voices in Pecoon's coalition. Pecoon is the farm worker union here in Oregon and they convened a coalition of stakeholder groups, inc including farm workers, um, environmental justice groups, us as the, as a farmer group and an ag uh, sector stakeholder, and many more to really bring that policy to the forefront and speak up for more equitable policies in labor in the agricultural movement. So um, we participate in many coalitions across the state. Um, you're going to hear from folks from some of our more formal coalitions and some of our um, our organizational relationships. So we are part of the Stand Up to Factory Farms Coalition, who you'll hear later. We are part of the Oregon Organic Coalition, who you'll hear from tonight as well. We are uh, members of the Oregon Community Food Systems Network, which is one of the biggest coalitions across the state. And that's where we do a lot of work with our partners at the Farmers Market Fund and with ORCAN. And we're so grateful and excited about what we have in store as a movement here in 2023. So um, I think that the last slide is just a picture of one of our rallies. This one is from 2019. And um, we will, just, just a note, we are inviting the groups you're hearing from tonight to participate in our rally day. It's going to be in Eugene this year because the capital steps that you see here are closed for construction this year. So we couldn't hold it in Salem. And most of the capital meeting spaces are also closed. So we're doing a hybrid approach. We're all learning together. So join us in Eugene on March 5th. That's a Sunday for a rally to uh, better our local community food systems together. So with that, thank you all so much for being here. And I'll hand it back over to Brittany. All right. So our first speaker on the panel tonight is Molly Natariani from Farmers Market Fund here to talk about the important program of Double Up Food Bucks. This wildly successful program makes it easy for low-income Oregonians to eat more fruits and vegetables while supporting family farmers and local economies. So Molly, thank you so much for being here. Can you talk about how we can all help to move this program forward and help it grow? And yeah, yay, thank you. I'm gonna do a quick screen share here. Can I see a thumbs up that people are seeing a slide as it should be? Yeah, yep. awesome, perfect, thank you. Um, and thank you, Alice, for that, that beautiful framework of just working together in coalition. I feel like that's one of my favorite pieces about being engaged in this legislative work. And so, yeah, what a, what a nice framework to start with. Um, all right, so. Uh, double up food books. Nice to hear a little blip about it from the folks who participate in it. I feel like we all watch out for our community. Um, so my name is Molly Natariani. I work at the Farmers Market Fund and we coordinate the Double Up Food Books program, which is a SNAP matching program. 
Here's our mission. We make healthy, locally grown food accessible to all Oregonians. Those are some Double Up Food Books. And I'll tell you a little bit about how this Double Up Food Books program works. So it's simple, it's elegant. Buy $20, you get $40. So it's a dollar for dollar match up to $20 per day. You take your Oregon Trail card. It could also be a, a EBT card from a different state. You go to the info booth at your farmer's market, you'll receive $20 of SNAP currency and then $20 of double up food bucks that can be used to purchase fruits and veggies as well as um, seeds and you know fruit and veggie starts from the vendors at the farmer's market. And so we really see this program as a, a beautiful triple win, right? It's clearly helping families access more fresh fruits and veggies at the same time, that money's working twice. It's helping farmers uh, access new customers and make more money. And the third piece of all of this is that it helps keep money in our local economy. So USDA just recrunched all of their numbers in the past year and actually found out that every dollar of SNAP that's spent in a farm direct sense, so you know, CSA, farmers market, actually generates three dollars in local economic activity. So that's pretty powerful. Um, so this program just meets a lot of goals and it's really inspiring to me. But it's not just Farmers Market Fund. We work really strongly with a coalition of partners who are not on this, uh, this webinar today, I don't think, but I wanna lift up because they all help make it happen. So we kind of uh, coordinate the program and we implement it at Farmers Markets. We work with the Pacific Northwest CSA Coalition who implements a Double Up Food Bucks program at CSAs. The Oregon Food Bank implements Double Up Food Bucks at grocery stores. Right now, they're really focused on BIPOC owned grocery stores, as well as grocery stores that are providing culturally familiar produce. And then the Oregon Farmers Markets Association has a, a small but kind of crucial piece of the project. They are kind of in the pipeline, the Double Up Food Bucks pipeline. So, you know, you can't participate in Double Up Food Bucks if you're not authorized to accept SNAP. So OFMA works with farmers markets who aren't set up to off, uh, aren't authorized to accept SNAP yet and uh, helps them through that you know, tenuous federal process. So then in the future, they can do double at food bucks. Should I be keeping an eye on the Q&A or is somebody else doing that? Right. Oh, yeah. Cynthia, I'm gonna get to your cue later. <laughs> Sorry, but Brittany, are you gonna keep an eye on the Q&A? Yep. Okay, cool. And here's just a, a little snapshot of what we've got going on this year. So I'm not gonna read the numbers, you can read them yourself, but a pretty broad um, coverage of the state as far as where folks are living and eating and, and producing food. So we'll start with a, an overview of kind of the work that our coalition has done together in the Oregon legislature. So um, in our first attempt, we went to the state and requested funding and in 2019, we got $1.5 million. And at that point, that was when we were actually able to, with that funding, begin the program at grocery stores before it had just been CSAs and farmers markets. But we realized that, you know, there are lots of reasons why those options don't work for everyone, even though they're fantastic. You might live far away from one, the hours might be difficult. You might not feel comfortable in those environments because you don't see people who look like you. And so groceries is a way to, to broaden to more shoppers. Um, the program was successful and continued to grow. So in 2021, we went back to the state and requested and received $4 million of one-time funds, which we were so grateful for, and it's had such a big impact. Um, another piece of what is cool about Double Up Food Bucks is there's actually a federal grant opportunity with the unfortunate name of GUSNIP, and um, that grant requires a one-to-one -one match for every federal grant dollar. And so we were able to take all of that money that we got from the state that 5.5 million and get 5.9 million to continue to grow the program from a federal grant. So what's coming uh, this year, we're seeking an $8, or <laughs> wouldn't it be funny if it was just $8, um, an $8 million one-time appropriation from the state, um, kind of continuing that pattern of growth. And just like we've done in the past, our, our tactical vehicle, if you will, is a duplicate House and Senate bills. So we've got two just to have more opportunities to talk about it. Obviously only one of them would make it through and get funded, um, but that's kind of the mechanism that we're doing is these two bills to, to help support double food books. Um, 
So I'll do just a, a little bit of a snapshot on the impact of the program and then talk about the needs that we're seeing as we move into the upcoming legislative session. So here's a snapshot of double up use. And um, one really important thing happened in the program between 2021 and 2022. We actually increased the amount of double up food bucks that shoppers could get from $10 today to $20 per day. So that, as you can see, kind of more than double the impact of the program, which showed us that that, that $20 match was kind of the sweet spot that made it meaningful for people to be able to, you know, put in the extra effort to go to their farmer's market and participate in the program. So we, we see this as kind of indicative of continued growth and need and uh, potential for the program. And, you know, in addition to the, the dollars that are being spent, which are, of course, a really great way to measure impact, we also get a lot of qualitative feedback back from the people who participate in Double Up Food Bucks. And they're telling us things like, you know, they're consuming more fruits and veggies. They have more food in their house. Um, they're noticing improvements in their health from consuming more fruits and veggies. So we see big wins there. You know, the same with farmers, right? Most are saying that their customer base expanded. People are saying that they are growing different types of crops, um, that they've been able to hire more staff. And again, that they're making more money because of Double Up Food Bucks. So lots of, lots of great impacts that we're seeing. So I'll talk a little bit about food insecurity in Oregon. And I think this is a confusing topic because of the way that this data is collected. Um, we know that right now about one in 10 Oregonians are food insecure, which is of course more than we want. It was worse than that at the very beginning of the pandemic, but there was this huge infusion of support that kind of helped buffer us from the worst of food insecurity, but we know that things could change very quickly. What I wanna point out here, again, maybe this isn't a surprise, but you know, certain demographics experience uh, food insecurity at disproportionate rates. So we're seeing that you know, in communities of color, much higher than for white folks. Um, we also know that renters, single parents, people who live in rural areas um, and trans and gender non-conforming people are really experiencing a heightened level of food insecurity in Oregon. And so, you know, Double Up Food Box is a way to provide some support there. Um, this is some, some information about kind of the really immediate need that we're seeing in our surveys from the shoppers. This was data from a survey that we did this past year at farmer's markets of about 650 shoppers. Pretty much everyone said two things, which I think is not a surprise for us, given inflation, right? That rising costs have made it hard for them to make ends meet. And it's specifically made it hard for them to purchase fresh fruits and veggies. And we're seeing that, right? That inflation is around 10%. It's even higher for fruits and veggies and other food products. So we're facing this, this really you know, dire once in a lifetime experience. Um, and don't forget, <laughs> as I mentioned, kind of the, the impact of a lot of these really massive kind of emergency investments during the pandemic that are going to be ending, unfortunately, at some point in the future. So whether that's pandemic EBT, which was a, a SNAP adjacent program for families who receive free and reduced lunches, um, you know, the limits on time that people could participate in SNAP, the emergency allotments, which gave folks a, a larger amount of SNAP that bumped them up to the top level. All of those will be ending soon. And so kind of the additional support from programs like Double Up is crucial, as well as inflation, which I've already said. So I just like painted a really intense and bummer situation about why we need Double Up Food Bucks. But I also wanna share some of like the really exciting things that we have started and are hoping that we'll be able to do with this expanded support if we receive an additional appropriation from the state of Oregon. I think one of the things that across all of the partners is really important to us is being able to have the ability to continue that $20 match. I think, you know, we've seen such great participation and, um, the lovedness of it from shoppers. And it would be heartbreaking to have to cut back to $10 if we don't receive kind of continued funding, especially in this time of really significant need. Um, you know, we're really focused on expanding the geographic diversity and the number of sites, uh, specifically targeting 
you know, regions of the state that don't have outlets right now. We've got five more counties to bring on. Um, Oregon Food Bank, like I said, is really focused on working directly with BIPOC owned grocery stores and um, those that serve uh, culturally familiar fruits and veggies. Um, I saw a question about this. We are actually expanding Double Up Food Bucks to farm stands in 2023. We're excited about that. That'll be a small pilot that we're starting. We know that some rural communities, you know, may not have a farmer's market or, you know, a bunch of CSAs, but they might have a, a farm stand where folks are getting their produce. And we're also planning to introduce a digital currency at farmer's markets uh, to reduce some of the stigma that we've heard from shoppers about, I used to have a pile of them on my desk, but now I don't the paper double up food bucks currency. And that ties back to the last piece I said, which has really become kind of central to the double up food bucks program in recent years, which is integrating these feedback loops from the shoppers who participate in double up food bucks so we can lift barriers to participation in the program. We've got kind of three main ways that we get that feedback. One of them is from these surveys. We partner with Oregon State University to uh, evaluate the program and they do pretty comprehensive surveys of shoppers, of uh, farmers market managers, of folks who run grocery stores to learn about that. Um, Oregon Food Bank has a group of Double Up Food Books ambassadors. They work with a cohort of 10 ambassadors every year. Those ambassadors are from very specific communities and they're able to bring the voices and the feedback and the perspective of their community members and uh, help us learn how to um, remove barriers to help develop food bucks better serve those communities. And then the last kind of cornerstone of feedback collection is we partner uh, regularly, we meet every other month with Partner for Hunger Free Oregon SNAP Client Advisory Board. And that is a group of SNAP participants um, that Partners has uh, collaborated with in an ongoing sense to um, get, get their feedback about how to improve SNAP and specifically double up food bucks. Um, and yeah, a lot of the big changes that we've made to double up food bucks in the last year and continue to make into the future are really pieces to address those barriers that uh, SNAP participants have told us about. Um, I will be honest, I, I feel that collaboration is central. We, we get this work done together. And, um, you know, I mean, I think that that's something that is so deeply meaningful about Double Up Food Bucks. This is a picture of the logos from my one pager for 2021. So I, these groups supported us in 2021. We are hopeful that many of them will again, but I can't promise that they're all on board yet. We're, we're just starting to build our coalition. So if you or anyone you know wants to support Double Up Food Bucks, we would love that. I did in my racing through this presentation forget to mention one of our key partners in our legislative campaign, which is the American Heart Association. Um, so their lobbyist helps work to provide pro bono lobbying support for us. And um, you know that might seem like an unlikely partner, but they really believe that food is medicine. And so being able to access, you know, as much fruits and veggies as anyone wants, you know, has so many positive health outcomes. So uh, AHA. Is a, is a key partner in our campaign. And FOF, and Oregon Farming School Network, lots of, lots of folks are here. Um, I put that quote at my beginning of the presentation and here it is again. I just really like that one, sorry. Um, so you probably are all here because you believe this, but I want to tell you your voice matters and your elected official really wants to hear from you. And if you're feeling inspired and jazzed and wanna tell them why you think Double Up Food Bucks is important. Here are some things you could do. You could schedule a meeting with them. You could give them a phone call, send them an email. When we have a, our bill hearings, you could do written or a spoken testimony. You could go to FOF's lobby day. And there's my email. I'll put it in the chat. I'm sure there'll be a way to get it to you if you want to get involved. Um, I think it's easier than ever in some ways, if you want to sit on a Microsoft Teams meeting and give your testimony, I'm being a little blithe, but I think, um, you know, while there is something that's lost about being able to be active in the Capitol, I think it just is, removes a lot of um, difficulties for folks to have to get their body to Salem to be able to have a conversation. So I really do feel like it's easier than ever to, to be able to uh, share your feelings with, with your legislators. And there's a picture of that uh, Buff Lobby Day 
from a different angle. I think that's all I have. Do we want to do questions now or save them for yeah, later? Yeah, do you, do you want to talk about the bill sponsors for Develop Food Bucks? For oh, yes, yes, I do. Um, so we've got a House bill and a Senate bill. The sponsors are Rep Marsh, Senator Gelser Bluen, um, Senator Weber, and Rep Javadi right now. And we're we're collecting more, but those are them so far. So we've got bipartisan, bicameral support um, for our pre-session file bills. I don't have the bill numbers yet, but it will soon. Um, Great. Well, maybe we'll save this last question towards the end. But thank okay. you so much, Molly, for mm -hmm. giving the rundown on this important program. Next up, we have um, Megan Kempel from Oregon Climate and Agriculture Network. Orcan works with farmers, researchers, technical assistant providers, nonprofits, policymakers to promote, improve, and better understand farming for climate resilience in Oregon. We appreciate all the hard work you do to help farmers navigate this new normal of farming with constant challenges related to climate change and advocating for policies that advance soil health. So Megan, you wanna talk about um, what's up ahead in the 2023 session? Yeah, thank you so much. I'm gonna share my screen here. So I'm gonna try. There we go. Is that working all right? Yep. <clears throat> Great. Okay. I'm going to share a little bit about, I'm going to share a lot about a healthy soils bill to be introduced in the 2023 legislative session. And um, again, I'm with Oregon Climate and Ag Network, and we're working to empower a broad producer centered network to improve soil health across Oregon through education, collaboration. This is a great example of that and policy advocacy. And um, I'm gonna cover why, why are we working to advance the healthy soils bill, what our approach is, what's in the bill and what's next and how to engage. And so why a healthy soils bill? We know that farmers and ranchers need voluntary incentives and resources to implement soil health practices and this bill creates a, a new and comprehensive soil health initiative to provide those resources. Our approach has been really extensive listening to um, farmers and ranchers across the state, technical assistance providers, and partners that are working to advance climate resilience on Oregon's farms and ranches. And we use that information to um, create a report, Lay of the Land and Levers for Change, and held a series of policy listening sessions and used all of that feedback to develop our policy recommendations, nearly all of which are reflected in the Healthy Soils Bill, which is pretty extensive, um, extensive policy. Our, <coughs> our approach has also included engaging with the Global Warming Commission on their work to advance carbon sequestration on Oregon's natural working lands. And now we are ready to advance healthy soils policy and we're building on the success of other states. We're part of a national network of healthy soils um, uh, organizations working to advance healthy soils policy across this, the country and have really used those models um to develop this policy so really taking advantage of best practices for healthy soils policy um we are part an important part thing to know about the bill and our approach um, a couple of important things are that we're focusing on soil health in our framing in terms of how we navigate the political process and communicate with legislators as well as um, with potential supporters we're really focusing on soil health rather than climate in our messaging, although you'll hear me re refer to climate a little bit in this presentation. Um, we also are focusing on soil health principles rather than specific practices. So these are the soil health pr principles that we're focusing on. We do have some ways of um, giving guidance to um, the state around how to 
um, determine what practices um, to advance. And I'll share a little bit about that as well. We are um, creating, working to create a really comprehensive, we've tried to create a comprehensive policy and a policy that um, includes a lot of interagency collaboration. And in our advocacy efforts, we're engaging across the agriculture community. So we're really trying to cast a very wide net. That means that we are engaged and partnering with friends and family farmers and Oregon Association of Conservation Districts, but also with the Oregon Farm Bureau, for example, and asking for their support as well. Um, we have um, going to go through what's in the bill. So we have important statements about um, for our legislators about. Well, this is. I'll just walk through this. So, whereas statements, creation of a soil health initiative, a soil health advisory committee really laying out all of the interagency collaboration and specific roles for each of the um, entities, and then a roadmap for soil health. And the whereas statements are really important. They provide inspiration and political motivation for advancing the bill. So some of the reasons um, that we know this is important are that Oregon farms and ranches are a key economic sector, obviously. Um, soil health increases farmers and ranchers economic resilience as well as profitability. It increases farmers and ranchers resilience to drought and extreme weather events, has really great benefits for plant and animal health, as well as environmental benefits, reducing erosion, um, increasing water holding capacity, for example. And we know that voluntary incentives are needed and that it's important for us to leverage federal funding. Another, um, in, in addition to just promoting climate resilience, um, healthy soils practices also have the potential to sequester carbon in the soil and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So the environmental benefits are uh, really incredible. There's, there are, as I think, any of you who are working in the soil know soil health practices are just a win-win all around and the way we need to move. So creation of a soil health initiative, we, we have the purpose of this initiative, I'll kind of, I'll describe it in a minute, but the purpose is to promote and support farming and ranching systems to improve soil health in Oregon. Our goals are both agriculture viability, profitability, as well as environmental function. So um, we're laying out all of those pieces that we just talked about in terms of reducing erosion, increasing organic matter in soil, for example. And the strategies that we're using in the initiative are all of the strategies that we could think of. Everything we know that we need to advance soil health on Oregon's farms and ranches that we've heard through all of those listening sessions and um, policy engagement that we've done. So financial incentives, outreach and education, technical assistance, resources, and research. And I should really clarify, I'll talk about it again, but when we look at outreach and education, and technical assistance, we know that farmers learn best from other farmers. And so our approach is both providing agencies and um, technical assistance, farm service providers with resources um, to provide that support and also providing them with resources to support farmers in farmer to farmer education and also efforts to highlight practices and um, demonstration of good soil health practices on farms and ranches. So really highlighting what's, what's happening already as a model. So again, just farmer to farmer learning is really central to the approach here with the initiative. The initiative is a collaboration. Um, we basically named the entities that will need to be involved and to clarify around what state policy can and can't do, we are not um, regulating any producer. We are not telling any producer um, what to do. These are voluntary incentives. The same way we are not directly 
um, directing farmers and ranchers to do anything. Uh, the state policy is one that provides direction to our state agencies. So we are directing the Department of Ag, the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, Soil and Water Conservation Districts, and OSU, both Extension and the College of Ag, to work together to provide the support to offer resources to farmers and ranchers. So it's a collaboration between these four entities. And the collaboration includes, we tell the agencies, entities that they have to consult and collaborate, and coordinate with each other, assess and fill needs and gaps, use available data from existing baseline assessments and inventory, so we're not recreating the wheel, build their own capacities and the capacity of, us, of others, and develop a shared understanding of soil health practices. We are, in terms of how, how they develop a shared understanding, we are directing them to um, develop a shared and evolving understanding of soil health practices based on current understandings of soil health and emerging soil science and informed by experience and needs of producers as well as indigenous ecological knowledge. That language is in the, in the bill. The Department of Ag would have responsibilities for partnerships, identifying funding sources, so taking advantage of that uh, uh, federal funding that will be coming through the Inflation Reduction Act, um, and also marketing. And when I say marketing, that doesn't mean that they're in, responsible for marketing for the initiative, but they could be, they, there's some language that they would support farmers in communicating to their customers, providing resources to communicate to um, consumers about the benefits of soil health so that farmers and ranchers can take advantage of increased um, marketing opportunities because they use these great practices. Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board is, a, is an agency that basically provides grants for conservation practices and they, in the bill, would there would be a new um, fund um, basically a carve out fund for advancing soil health practices through the Oregon Ag Heritage Program of $2 million in the bill. And they'd also provide grants to soil and water conservation districts so they can provide farmers and ranchers with support. The soil and water conservation districts are basically directed if, they're, if they have capacity to take advantage of that money to um, receive those grants and provide that technical assistance, outreach and education. And then OSU Extension would be responsible for technical assistance, outreach and education with the soil and water conservation districts, as well as research and soil testing. And the, um, we wanna make sure that we have equitable access, that the state provides equitable access to resources. So the bill requires that the agencies ensure that that technical assistance, outreach and education are accessible on an equitable basis to producers across Oregon's diverse ag communities and geographies, including women, veterans, beginning and socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. And the bill also um, creates a, requires a soil health roadmap. So requires the state to create a plan for strategies and actions to advance soil health has to be completed in a year. And it would be created with input from a soil health advisory committee. And we've laid out um, the entities who have a seat, should have a seat. They're not people. They are um, types of, types of um, community members who should have a seat on that advisory committee. Um, what's next? We are heading into the legislative session, as we all know, um, starting on January 17th, officially, and opportunities for your engagement. If you'd like to help support this work, support this um, campaign, you can contact your legislator in support. You can testify at a hearing, either um, um, in writing or verbal, with verbal input, if you want to, um, stay informed and engaged. I think that BOF will very likely be providing um, periodic updates about some of the bills that they're interested in, uh, maybe including this one. You can also get involved directly with our policy work via an engagement survey that we have on our website, asking you questions about yourself and a question specifically around if you'd like to be engaged 
in our policy advocacy work. So that's a really easy way to plug in to ORCAN's policy work. And um, I here's the information about the engagement survey again. And it's a little hard to read the web, uh, my contact info, but you can also contact me directly if you um, have questions or just want to get engaged um, directly. And I'm almost at time. Perfect. Thanks, Megan. We appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Moving on. Um, so we need to ensure that independent family farms, not factory farms, are the future of livestock production in Oregon. Stand Up to Factory Farms is a coalition of local, state, and national organizations concerned about the harmful impacts of factory farms on Oregon family farms, communities, environment, and animal welfare. Amy Van Son and Lily DePaola are here today to talk to us about the CEFs Coalition's top legislative priority in all species tier two CAFO moratorium. So go ahead and take it away and tell us more. Sweet, I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, so as Bernie mentioned, my name's Lily. I'm the Stand Up to Factory Farms Coalition organizer. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about our legislation, but first I'm gonna hand it over to Amy so they can give a little more background on the coalition um, and all the work we've done previously. Hello, good evening. Thank you for joining us. I hope that folks at home have beer in anticipation of the uh, soon to be back in person uh, in formations with beer. I'm Amy, I'm uh, <laughs> with the Standard Factory Farms Campaign. I'm a senior attorney with the Center for Food Safety, uh, which we have long, uh, we're a national organization with offices here in Portland, Oregon, and have long fought animal factories as a terrible part of the industrial food system that need to go um, in support instead of family scale, pasture-based um, animal agriculture. And um, yeah, so let's get going here. Uh, as was already mentioned, we're a coalition. We include FAF and we include other groups that care about the Columbia River, that care about our gorge, uh, that care about animal welfare. Thank you for going to that slide that are concerned like with how much water we have in the future and whether or not that water supports wildlife and bio and diverse wildlife. And um, importantly, Oregon Rural Action representing some of the folks that are really at the front line of these the biggest factory farms in the state whose water, especially drinking water and air quality and uh, quality of life are threatened. So you could go ahead and slide forward. So uh, we came together as a group, uh, which is now 20, I'd say two dozen, um, at least two dozen members strong, member organizations strong, but we started as a smaller group concerned about this Lost Valley mega dairy that was trying to come in, down, uh, site itself on the former, a former tree plantation um, in Hermiston or near, near, the, near Boardman, Oregon, down the road from Three Mile Canyon, which is uh, the state's largest mega dairy and one of the largest dairies in the country which is permitted for 90,000 cows. And for reference, the federal definition of a large a dairy CAFO is 700 cows. So we're talking about factory farms that are orders of magnitude larger. And we were very concerned about this new mega dairy because we already had, again, the state's largest dairy and existing water contamination problems. This is in the groundwater management area for the lower Umatilla Basin. Um, and all those fancy words mean people's well water that they use to drink and cook and shower is contaminated with such high levels of nitrates that it is unsafe for health, especially for children, immunocompromised folks, uh, high levels of nitrates cause cancers, reproductive problems, a host of issues that you do not want. And this is an area that is um, on its way to becoming majority Hispanic and Latinx. It is a place that is you know, rural, lower income, uh, folks that already are having trouble that are going to have even more uh, not ex e be even more inaccessible to clean drinking water through filtration. So this is one of the big issues that we cited, and also it's very close to the Columbia River, a place that a lot of us care about. Uh, so we, we tried to fight off this big mega dairy, and we submitted very detailed comments as a coalition. Over four thousand of you guys, of Oregonians, submitted comments and said, like, please do not permit 
this new facility. We do not need a 30,000 cow dairy down the road from a 70,000 cow dairy. This area does not need 100,000 cows, not to mention other smaller factory dairies that are around. Um, unfortunately, the state said, well, we have no power to say no to this. And they issued a permit. They said, this is the strongest permit we've ever issued. It's like a brand new car. It's not going to fail. This is great. But um, unfortunately, the owner of this dairy, who's a, a dairyman from California, Greg Teveld, he uh, had a bit of a gambling and substance abuse problem and was a terrible manager of this dairy. They started accruing violations of their water quality permit right away. They racked up over 200 violations of this permit before the state finally listened to us and shut them down. Um, and so that was one of our victories as a campaign. We could not stop it from being permitted, but we did help get it shut down. Um, now it sits there and it is owned by, it went through bankruptcy and resale, and it is owned by the Easterday family, which you may have heard of Cody Easterday because he did this little, little fraud of Tyson beef to the tune of a quarter of a billion dollars and is now sitting in federal prison for the next 11 years. So one of the things that we have been trying to tell our legislators and our policymakers is look, we're all in favor of responsible stewards of the land, but these folks are not responsible. These folks do not care about our laws or our environment or our communities. They're here to make money, like gobs and gobs of profit off of these huge mega dairies and to edge out the competition from smaller family farms who've had dairies, hundreds of dairies in the state for, for decades. Um, so in an effort to pause this influx of mega dairies, because we're talking about now infrastructure at the port of Moro, and that's allowing, and, and uh, Tillamook having their creamery there, allowing for a huge market to buy, to be selling milk to Tillamook, which is a well-beloved um, pro, you know, um, company, and then to be selling milk to the rest of the world. Um, so this was a, we consider, we, we were concerned this is a magnet for people to come in and open these big facilities from other states like California and Washington. And the more, um, the, the better laws that those states enact to protect their own environment and their own communities, the more Oregon looks great for its lax uh, laws. So we tried to do a moratorium bill a couple of times in a row. We've managed to get some good public hearings that were highly contentious. <laughs> um, and so a lot of misinformation spread by our friends at the Farm Bureau. But um, we have not successfully passed a moratorium yet, but uh, I think it's probably time to send it over to Lily to talk about what I'm very excited for this year, which is we're opening it up to an all factory farm moratorium because it turns out we're not just a dairy state, uh, we're also being threatened by mega chicken. So I'll send it over to Lily. Awesome, thank you, Amy. Yeah, so as Amy mentioned, um, we made the decision this year, instead of just working for a mega dairy moratorium, we're working for an all factory farm, large tier two, um, and I'll get into what that means, but ban this year. Um, and this was, mostly due to the fact that we're seeing a lot more large chicken factory farms also trying to move into the state. Specifically in the Willamette Valley, there are two new facilities that have been permit permitted um, where the farmers would be contract growers with foster farms and they would have millions of chickens within this very concentrated area. And in spite of community outrage to these facilities, we're seeing um, our government generally support them. So. Given that situation, we kind of thought, well, we can fight mega dairies, and then we still have all of these issues with other species as well. So that kind of brought us around to expand this year to every um, large factory farm. And we're very excited um, because we have seen a lot of progress in general and um, with this expanded bill and a lot of support. So this year we have a bill number. So we're House Bill 2667 and our lead sponsor is gonna be Representative Zach Hudson um, with co-chief sponsor, Senator Michael Dembro and Senator Jeff Golden who have been really champions of this all along and have been very involved in the issue. So that's really great. And then um, in our pre-filed bill, we also have five other co-sponsors that are listed here. So if you do not see your legislators, um, you should definitely give them a call and tell them that 
they should be supporting our factory farm, farm moratorium as well. Um, so I will just jump ahead here. So what does a factory farm moratorium mean? Essentially what we're shooting for with this house bill is that it would prohibit the Department of Environmental Quality and the State Department of Agriculture from issuing or renewing licenses or permits for these large tier two CAFOs. So essentially we couldn't build any more of these big facilities and then smaller CAFOs that are trying to expand into this bigger size would also be not allowed to do that. Um, and the Department of Environmental Quality defines CAFOs based off of the number of animals in the facility on also the days that they are confined, the amount of time that animals are confined within these facilities without being let out on pasture at all, and also with how they are um, dealing with their wastewater or manure. And so that's kind of where the CAFO permitting process comes in. Yeah, and just one point of clarification, we use the word CAFO a lot, uh, but the Oregon CAFO is is really kind of right every dairy because you know obviously we have bad weather here you're going to confine your animals at some point of the season because of the bad weather like right now crazy winds and storms uh but it's really about the lagoon and spray system so the antiquated collecting all the waste in a water you know cesspool and then spraying that onto fields to get rid of it as opposed to pasture so uh, when you hear us say CAFO we mean factory farm large factory farm not not a kind of the any dairy CAFO that Oregon uses. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Um, yeah, and so just for reference, I'm throwing up here the tier two size factory farm as just so those of you who are curious about what, what those sizes really look like um, can see them. And um, yeah, so that's that. And then, um, yeah, well, actually, could I could I add in there just the, anticipating potential questions of like, why that size? Um, we started our factory for our dairy mega dairy moratorium with 2500 cows or more. And we picked that number uh, in part because, it, you know, was sort of from Idaho, they had used that number, but really, we want it to be larger than the federal definition of large, which is again, 700 dairy cows, mature dairy cows. Now that already is pretty big and in the thousands, even in the low thousands, you're talking about a lot of waste, like the waste the size of a small city. But uh, we wanted to leave room because we know that farmers who are doing dairy, say organic, um, you know, you have to keep getting bigger to like compete in this market. So we didn't want to cut out um, uh, folks that really are doing family scale dairy, but that have, um, you know, have to kind of keep getting bigger just to stay alive. Um, that's, you know, due to corporate consolidation and the national, um, you know, the, the international markets and all sorts of things. So we picked 2,500 and then ODA also decided to use 2,500 as their tier two of large uh, facilities under their general permit. So when we, when you heard tier two, it's basically, that's what all these numbers come from. It's in a pay, it's basically like how much you have to pay um, to in permit fees. And so we did take it from ODA, Department of Ag, because that makes a lot of sense. Um, and so that's where these numbers are from. And for the broiler chickens with dry waste system, you'll notice it's at three, 350,000. So for example, the facility in SIO, the JS Ranch is proposing to raise uh, more like five, over 500,000 at a time, 3.5 million a year in broiler chickens. So this kind of moratorium would also prevent those mega chicken facilities, the three that are currently proposed in the Willamette Valley, from going, from getting a permit. Um, so yeah, just adding into that of like why this number, it has a basis. Um, and again, like this won't shut any down that exist. It'll just stop them from expanding. So, you know, not gonna touch Three Mile Canyon, um, it's there, uh, but it will put a pause for a long time until we can get our act together and make sure these things are actually safe for the communities and the environment and the animals involved. Perfect. Thank you, Amy. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of ways to get involved. We are, as I said, super excited about the legislation this year, and we see more possibility than ever of it moving further and not just dying in committee. So um, 
with that, there are a lot of ways you can help support us. Um, you can send an email to your legislators. We actually have a message action that you can do that with, and I will throw that into the chat just in a minute. Um, you can call your legislators as well and let them know that you'd like to, them to support the Factory Farm Moratorium. Um, and for those of you here who represent an organization, we also have an organizational sign-on letter and we would love to have um, your support there as well. And then you can also follow us on social media. You can learn more on our website and Amy and I also would totally be happy to um, connect with you if you're interested in getting more involved in the campaign further on. Yes, email Lily. <laughs> I mean, I'm very responsive to email, but Lily's really is the person who will be wrangling any volunteers if you want your senator representative co-sponsor the bill because you're like, yeah, factory farms are silly. Why would we have them in Oregon? Then hit us up. Awesome, thank you too. I hope people are inspired to take action. That's literally what we're doing tonight. So um, yeah, thanks for being here. All right, our last speaker tonight is Amy Wong. Some of you might recognize her from our previous work at FOF, but she's here tonight to talk about the priorities of the organic or Oregon Organic Coalition. So the Willamette Valley is known worldwide for producing high quality vegetable and cover crop seed because of canola's well-documented plant disease and cross-pollination issues. It's been heavily regulated in the Willamette Valley for decades. In addition to telling us um, it, to where that stands and what that means for the specialty seed and cover crop seed industries in Oregon, Amy's gonna also be outlining the ways that OOC is asking the state to take action to support the expansion of organic farming practices. Good okay. evening, everyone. Thank you so much for that um, introduction, Brittany. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. All right. Are you seeing the right thing? Yep, you're good. Okay, wonderful. So first of all, our lobbyist, Jonathan Nanton, was supposed to be here tonight. So I put, whipped this together and it probably, I probably won't be as detailed as many of my esteemed colleagues in, um, on this call, but um, thank you for having me all the same. Um, let's see, just a quick background for those of you who don't know the Oregon Organic Coalition. It was founded by organic leaders over 15 years ago. And really, um, the last five years, we've moved into doing more serious uh, legislative and agency advocacy. Stacey Crocker had been the previous board president and had really started to lead those efforts along with Jonathan. Uh, and I've been here for about a year. Um, so let's see, we work to advance the development and growth of the organic industry, practices, and community in Oregon. And our vision is resilient regional food systems rooted in organic practices, honestly certified or not. We really see that the benefit of organic fact practices leads to healthier soil and many other benefits. And that's where we'd like to see the expansion of these practices across farms in Oregon and beyond. Um, in terms of our legislative agenda. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about canola tonight, as well as some other legislation that we are leading. And, you know, we also will be supporting many of the bills that you all discussed tonight, as well as agency advocacy and things like that. I'm not going to get into that, but I'm always happy if anyone has questions or wants to check in about things like that at a later time. Uh, and in terms of our approach to crafting our legislative agenda, it's been developed over the last few years, certainly in concert with the organic community and beyond. We're also members of the Oregon Community Food Systems Network. And a lot of our work has come out of the initial draft of the Oregon Organic Action Plan. And so we've been knowing that a huge organic action plan like California has one would be a lot for our legislature. We've been working on the low hanging fruit pieces of the organic action plan. And we have, we know um, that technical assistance is a really important thing. So that's what we had advocated for the beginning of the organic extension program at OSU. Um, 
And we also know that in terms of market development, uh, organic has long been a good leader. It's third party verified. It's backed by federal law. That's a really great market development piece. And so we were successful last legislative session in getting an organic economic assessment, which the executive summary will be coming out in March of this coming year. So we're actually holding a couple legislative vehicles to, after that um, assessment comes out to see what else we would want to be doing. So the cadence of our legislative agenda is a little bit different this year. Um, so I will move on. Why organic? Um, we believe that when rooted in the core organic principles of health, ecology, fairness, and care, organic can create a more equitable food system that doesn't just prioritize the bottom line. Organic farmers are focused on healthy soils by law. See Title VII, Section 204 of the Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, and, and we are seeing organic soil has up to more up to 44% more stable sequestered carbon than conventional soil, 60% higher soil stability than conventional soil, and water infiltration is almost 10 times greater than conventional soils, suggesting organic soils are better to thrive in drought and flood conditions, which we're certainly seeing. And organic, even as a floor in term of ag practices, is regenerative and builds organic agricultural and economic resilience. Okay, so uh, as Brittany mentioned, um, Thoth has long worked on this, and I've been working on canola, uh, actually more, I'd like to frame it as protecting our very valuable uh, vegetable specialty seed industry in the Willamette Valley from potential increased canola cultivation. And uh, when I was at FOF, I worked with Organic Seed Alliance to create a, a seed policy roadmap for the Pacific Northwest. So if you want more background on this issue, we do a deep dive into it there. And this is, I'm very excited to soon be sharing uh, another economic assessment that the Oregon Organic Coalition, along with Organic Seed Alliance, had done specifically for brassica seed, because that's an incredibly valuable crop in the Willamette Valley. Um, and so we just have the first draft and, and partners are reviewing it now. And so this is gonna be a really cool tool that we'll be sharing out uh, during session and closer to session. And I'm sure we'll do some more deep dives on it, but the first initial pass of it is really promising and really exciting. So we pre-session filed a bill in the Senate. Uh, Gelser, Senator Gelser Bruin has long been a champion of this issue, so has Rep Holby. So we had uh, two ex ex bills that were the same and they came back very different. And so we're actually refiling both of those. And so these numbers, big caveat, they probably will change. We'll make sure that people are updated um, it, through many ways, our website, social media, through the Oregon Community Food Systems Network. But we are working with a coalition of folks and are feeling pretty good about this so far. It, it's complicated because the biggest um, proponent of canola is now a sitting legislator, Rep. Anna Sharp. So that just complicates matters, but we're hoping that will still prevail. And we, this is probably the third big legislative canola battle, and we're really hoping this is the last one. So to be determined. And another uh, bill that we're working on, it's farmer support through state organic cost share match and transition support. So many of you might know that the Oregon Department of Agriculture and FSA already administers USDA's federal organic cost share match, which uh, used to be 75% of a farmer's organic cost share. It was reduced to 50. Um, this is a farmer, Stacy Denton, down in Southern Oregon. She is an organic flower farmer and seed farmer, and she was mentioning how important the cost share is to her helping her business be um, successful. And so we're hoping that this is a way to give farmers who are already implementing practices that we know are creating better conditions and more economic resiliency, some more support. And we're also hoping to have some sort of support mechanism for education uh, for farmers going through the transition process. So this would be uh, administered by ODA since they already are administering the federal match. It would just be adding a state match on top of it. So hopefully it won't be too onerous for the agency to take on. We're not creating an entirely new program. Uh, and, and so yeah, we'll see what happens with this. Uh, and 
Senator Dembro is the chief sponsor. And unfortunately, because again, Jonathan was going to be presenting, I, I don't want to I'm not exactly sure who all the co-sponsors are that he got signed on, but we'll be sharing that out, I'm sure, in short term time as well. Uh, okay, so as I mentioned earlier, the Oregon Organic Coalition had led the efforts along with our coalition partners to build out the organic extension program at OSU. This is us on a farm tour in PD, Oregon this fall uh, with the first two organic extension agents, uh, Nick Andrews, uh, who does vegetable production, and Cheyenne Gajar, who does pastures and forages. And I really want to reiterate that these extension agents are available to help all farmers, not just organic. And in fact, on this day, while we're out in the field, Cheyenne mentioned that indeed they have had more non-organic farmers reach out because they are seeing the benefit that these organic practices are bringing to all farms. So that's exciting. Uh, and we do have a bill that has these positions like we did last short session, which uh, Dr. Lyles in this picture came and supported, but we are trying to work with OSU right now through their resilience package and, and or we'll work a budget process for these. So we probably won't be pushing an actual bill around this, at least not right now. And our last bill, we've asked for this a couple of times and we worked with uh, former director Taylor on crafting language for an organic policy special assistant at ODA. Uh, or Oregon is the fifth largest, uh, you know, it's in the top five organic producers in the country. And so we think that our Department of Ag should have someone with a lens on organic throughout all of ODA's various programs. So uh, Senator Pozonski is the chief sponsor, I know for sure. And uh, I'm sure there's others who have signed on that Jonathan could, could get us. Uh, so if you want to learn more or support, you all have heard the drill. We will be looking for people to testify or submit testimony, or if you want to sign on, please reach out and you're welcome to visit our website. Uh, and if you want to learn more about us, we did complete an impact report at the end of last year. So I will leave it there and see if there's any questions. And just again, thank you all for having me. Thanks, Amy. Thanks for being here. Yeah, I think um, if anybody has any questions about especially testimony or engaging with your legislators, again, we have videos. We just did an advocacy workshop series that's all about how to participate in the legislative session in 2023. So there's a lot of good tips and um, kind of an instruction of how to walk through and what's important um, on how, when you're talking with your legislators or when you're writing testimony. So we have those on our website. We, you can watch the video. And it's really important that legislators hear from all of everybody. I mean, as much as, much as you can reach out to them, it's they, they wanna hear from you. So if you have any questions, go ahead and put those in the, in the question box. We have one from earlier and it's how do farms get involved for farm stands? I think this was the double up food bucks. Um, and I think that was about, I, you had mentioned that farm stands is kind of part of kind of a pilot program. So is there a way that farm stands can reach out or get involved on how to? Yeah, good question. Um, the farm stand program hasn't started yet. It's going to start this season. So I'll just put my email in the chat. And then if you are the farm that is interested or know the farm that is interested, just shoot me an email and I can connect you with the person who's coordinating that program. Hey, Brittany, I have a question. Go for it. Um, so this is a question for Megan. Um, so, I mean, I heard Molly mention that this is the money that we get from the state for double up food bucks is matched by a federal grant. And you referenced some of the possibility of matching some of your soil health funding with federal things. And I think it would be helpful for folks if you could outline some of the federal opportunities that we're trying to leverage with the Healthy Soils Bill. That is a tricky one because we don't know very much at all. Even our federal agency partners don't know very much about the money that's coming and what it will do there. One thing I can say, what it will be for, when I can say that the, there are um, federal conservation programs that provide incentives to farmers and ranchers. And those 
programs will receive significant investments from the infrastructure, I'm sorry, the Inflation Reduction Act. We don't know how or for what. We know that those, they have restrictions on, they will be focused on climate, uh, incentivizing climate-friendly agricultural practices, practices that either sequester carbon or reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So many of you may be aware that the Inflation Reduction Act had a really strong focus on climate mitigation. And so all of the money that goes to the federal programs through the Natural Resource Conservation Service, NRCS, has these restrictions that it has to be for um, climate mitigation and carbon sequestration. And so the, where there's an intersection between potential for carbon sequestration and soil health practices, there's a potential for leveraging that federal money. Um, a very clear, actually, I have a really good example of one way that federal money can be um, leveraged that's much simpler and that I'm really excited about. There's a, um, a farm bill, marker bill, uh, section of language that we hope will be incorporated into the farm bill called the Agriculture Resilience Act. Some of you have heard about it before. And it includes funding for states for soil health um, plans and soil health programs. And it, that there it's buckets of money for states to dole out to producers for soil health practices. If we have a soil health initiative, if we have a strong soil health program in place with the state, we will be one of the first in line, could be one of the first in line to receive that money from the feds if that piece is passed as part of the farm bill. So that's an example of federal funding that we could really leverage if we just, the state just invested in creating the program and then the money for the grants could come from the feds. That's the idea in all of those cases. I have another question. Um, this is another question. It's actually also for Megan, but I think that we, you mentioned in your presentation that part of this um, funding would be administered through a portion of the um, Oregon Agricultural Heritage Program. And I know that we did a lot of, um, you know, advertising and promotion of the round that they had open in the fall for conservation easement funding and such. And so I was wondering if you could briefly explain um, where, how that program plays into the Healthy Soils Bill. Sure, I'll try to keep it simple. The Ag Heritage Program has two main Components. One is the conservation and um, the easement program, and the other is for um, conservation management planning. There's making your plan, and then there's implementing your conservation management plan. And when you are implementing your conservation management plan, soil health is a significant piece of it's a, a very allowable and encouraged practice through the conservation management plan. So we wanna incentivize, the state already has recognized that the conservation management plan grants will incentivize soil health practices. And we're just requesting a kind of a carve out of $2 million to say, great, do all your other, keep it up with all the other conservation management plan activities. And let's make sure that there's at least $2 million just for soil health. And we're not gonna take any money away from the rest of the conservation management plan grants, we're gonna ask for an additional $2 million to make sure that there's a special pot for soil health in those grant programs. And many of you may be aware that those grants aren't even available yet. There aren't conservation management plan implementation grants yet, but that's next on the docket for the agency to roll out. And so it fits really well. And it's a great example of um, just a way that we can take advantage of existing programs without creating a whole new um, a whole new structure within the agency. Great, thank you, Megan. Um, I saw a question that Amy actually had, um, Amy had for other Amy in the chat earlier um, and how the situation with the um, declaration of emergency in Morrow County and the water quality problems there um, how is that relating to, or how do all of these things play together? The declaration of emergency, the county commissioner recalls, and whether or not the mega dairy is um, 
you know, being named as a main source of the nitrate contamination that's happening in that area. If you could speak to that situation a little bit and how it plays into the moratorium campaign, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. So like I said earlier, you know, the groundwater contamination in the area where these biggest mega dairies are either existing or planned is one of the big reasons why we wanted to stop these things as we are, there's already this issue. And luckily, uh, Commissioner, I believe, now recalled or soon to be recalled commissioner Jim Doherty said oh let's actually start testing the wells of people's drinking water and found some really disturbing results like really really extremely high levels of nitrates and and the only way to get rid of them is this like very complex expensive filtration for your whole house otherwise you have to use bottled water and you can't boil it out it actually concentrates the nitrates more and they're flavorless, odorless, colorless. So you have no idea how dangerous your tap water is until you have it tested. And so he did a bunch of testing with the health department and has been leading this charge along with our partners, Oregon Rural Action, to get the state to do something, to actually spend money on this problem. Um, so some of the other issues here, well, we've known since the 90s that this was a problem in this area. That's when it was designated as a groundwater management area. Um, and so the state knows that. And in fact, the state has done some testing and some, you know, they have a report from 2011, back in 20, well, 10 years ago, saying that yes, CAFOs, uh, CAFOs and mega dairies are a big source of these, these pollutants, the nitrates specifically. Um, they're the biggest generator of the nitrates because it's in the cow waste and that it gets into the groundwater both at these facilities and in irrigated agriculture uh, where it's being spread on fields. So it's not the, mega dairies aren't the only culprit, uh, but they're a big part of it and certainly a big ongoing, you know, adding to that waste load. Um, I, the recall is absolutely because of that testing. They had cited some other things like a firing, but really I'm reading between the lines that, you know, folks in the area, conventional ag, industrial ag folks do not want to be, you know, uh, they don't want to, they don't want it to be known that, that there's pollution that they're causing. Um, and so, yeah, it's really unfortunate that someone who actually stood up for the health of their constituents is getting called and sent out of office. But um, that's why we need, that's why we're going to Salem to say like, look, um, you know, at the county level, this can happen, but like state legislators, you need to stand up for every community in the state and make sure that no one is sacrificed to the profits of this of this industry. Um, I think that answered all of the various questions, but I will add one more thing that our campaign did. A bunch of us were part of a petition to EPA, so federal level environmental protection agency under the Safe Drinking Water Act for emergency action for the folks in Morrow County and Umatilla County who are affected by this. And it's been pending for a while. The EPA did actually like write some letters to the state, say, hey, what are you doing to correct this problem? So we may see some action on that. We're trying to get a meeting right now with EPA um, to try to you know, continue to force that issue because as, as I've heard from the county, from Morrow County and you know from the commissioners, they're like, we don't have any money for this. The state needs to pay for it. So somebody, the buck stops somewhere. And um, that's some of the legal actions that we work, we've worked on in addition to and while supporting the general moratorium uh, at the legislative level. Thank you for, for connecting those dots. I think it's really important that we understand um, what can happen to the rural communities that the farmers that FOF represents lives in if these uh, factory farms are able to proliferate. So um, I think that my, I, I'm sorry that I'm asking so many questions, but I have, um, I don't see any more in the chat right now, but I was wondering if Amy and Lily, if you could talk about, you referenced some, um, you know, greater protections that are in surrounding states. And I was wondering how you could um, compare what we are trying to do with the moratorium or other regulations in other states and how they compare to Oregon to kind of give context to our situation here and why we're so attractive to these facilities right now and why it's trending in that direction. Yeah, I'm happy to, to field that one as well. So California um, did start regulating air emissions from dairies or generally including methane. And that's something we tried to do here via petition to the environmental um, Quality Commission, the writing rules for DEQ to actually create uh, an air, a, a program to control the air emissions from 
dairies uh, and that would, you know, large dairies, right? And that would include things that are toxic to health, but also especially methane, which is a huge greenhouse gas. And so Florida, Florida, oh my God, <laughs> not Florida, California has been doing that uh, a little bit better. And, you know, what, some of our work down there is to ensure that some of this money that's going to dairies to try to reduce their emissions doesn't go just to factory farm gas digesters or methane digesters, because that just entrenches the problem. It, is, it leads to expanded uh, herd sizes. So uh, we're trying to make sure that money actually goes to people that want to switch to regenerative pasture-based, um, you know, like the past Oregon Pasture Network folks, what they're doing. So, um, so California has some stricter rules. And there's been some um, great court wins in Washington and in Idaho uh, recently, uh, the Ninth Circuit um, for the permit for Idaho for this, this water quality permit said, yeah, you need to have monitoring. Like, we don't know if you're complying with the permit if you're not monitoring the water and seeing if you're discharging into it. And a similar court decision came from the Court of Appeals in Washington. That was something we were involved in. So those permits are being rewritten right now. Whether or not they're good enough, unfortunately, the Washington one is not. But there's there's a lot of movement in the states around Oregon to be to be doing better on this permitting. Um, a lot of that is through our advocacy as a as a movement. Um, and so, yeah, without getting into like too many more specifics, I will say that this moratorium is 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 pretty novel among states. It would be the first one to go into effect uh, if we pass it this session. Uh, and, you know, Senator Booker's bill, the Farm Systems Reform Act at the federal level, also is a moratorium and ban on new factory farms of all types, and then a transition away from them. So it's actually cessation of all that, you know, so it's, it's very forward thinking, you know, hopefully it gets introduced again, or we get some piece of it maybe um, in the farm bill, you know, a person can dream. But um, so it's not like a, a strange concept, but it is, it would be the first of its kind bill. And other states are, are trying to follow suit and do similar things. I mean, Iowa has had a campaign on a moratorium for a long time because of the hog and the chicken facility, you know, factory farms there that are, have really decimated their, their water supply. Um, so yeah, I, I could ramble on way too long. <laughs> I'm gonna stop. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's some really helpful context. Um, uh, I, we're almost to time, but I have one more question. Um, I think that um, I am wondering if Molly, if you could give a couple of, um, you know, dates to watch out for, because during the session, we will also have another, you know, season of farm stands and farmers markets and all of those things. Are there any dates that people should look out for to sign up to, to participate in the Double Up Food Bucks program as a farmer's market or um, a farm stand, or if they have, for example, if there's a farmer on this call who sells to a grocery store who they know takes SNAP and should be participating in this program, are there any dates or deadlines that you wanna um, put out there so that we can generate more, more success stories and get more Double Up Food Bucks and fresh produce to more people during the session as well? I love it. Thanks, Alice. Um, yeah, so our main Double Up Food Bucks program at Farmer's Market starts on May 1st or whatever the, the day of the Farmer's Market is after May 1st. And we do a broad call for applications for Farmer's Markets who want to participate. Uh, I don't actually know the date because I am phasing out of my current role at FMF, but I would say it's like by the end of January, there is going to be an application. And if I think I put my email in the chat. So if any of you know a farmer's market that hasn't done double up food books yet, but wants to, like we are here to provide support and would love to have them join. Um, the farm stand program is new. And so again, send me an email if you want to join. I think the goal for that is to have that program start in April and run probably through November. We've heard from the farmers that we've talked about that that like a late fall kind of Halloween to Thanksgiving period is often the busiest period of the year. So while the farmer's market program ends at the end of October, we want to have an extra wiggle room for farm stands and um, grocery stores. Yes, that is an autonomous program that the Oregon Food Bank coordinates. And um, I'm happy to connect you with them. They've got, I think, as I've mentioned, um, a lot of factors that they take into account when they're choosing sites because they want to meet kind of multiple goals of serving community and, you know, um, meeting their equity goals. And so 
Um, but yeah, I think, you know, you are the expert on the store in your community where people shop. And since we probably don't live there, we want to know. So, yes. And you can always just, um, you know, shop at these outlets as a shopper, right? Spend money with your, with your local farmers. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we're almost at time and we're really excited everybody was here. Um, we have, I just want to mention, FOF is also working on a farm direct enhancement and a raw milk expansion for our other two bills that we're going to put in as proposals for this legislative session. So we have a lot going on. We're going to keep track of everything and keep everybody up to date. It's really important to kind of pay attention and stay involved, especially if you're passionate about these issues, because we we, it's kind of a quick turnaround of when we need people to kind of step in and support and write testimony and give their important perspective. So stay in touch with FOF, stay in touch with all these other organizations and kind of just be on standby, but we're here to help. So reach out to whoever at any organization that you um, have an issue that you want to um, give your perspective. Um, we're here to help you out and to help walk you through um, and kind of pull out the important pieces of your story and make sure that the legislators hear exactly what they need to hear and how they need to hear it. So um, I think the moral of the story, though, is just to stay involved and stay in touch. Um, so we will definitely be keeping everybody in the loop. So just stay um, on our newsletter and we'll share all of the important information on our website as well with all these bills. So thank you so much for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. As I said, we had a advocacy uh, workshop series that completed and now our information series is complete and we'll have all of these recordings available to everybody on our website and I'm going to send a follow-up email out with all of these resources we talked about and everybody's contact information and websites so stay in touch with that and thank you so much panelists we just really really appreciate your time and your passionate energy into um, all the work that you're putting into our food system. So thank you so much and everybody stay in touch. Thank you. Happy 2023. Thanks everybody. Have a good night. Bye.